A Sweet Taste of Cake, Chapter 5, The Deal. Being quarry means that you've been pursued, that they have pounced on your moments of weakness and used them to rip away parts of you. You are determined to never show weakness again. Being quarry means that you started a shipping company. It means that some point you took out an option on your lease of an airship from the bank. When the bank failed, you lost everything. Being quarry means moving on, trying everything, only to have everything stolen from you. Backroom deals and leverage options and the games played with imaginary money on start charts. Being quarry means that you landed in Ponyville. There's something that never happened to you before. You made a friend. Clyde watched her skip along, watching happily as Pinkamina made her little game of flipping rocks. So he sang to herself as she made them rest once more on the good earth. Letting them grab at these last few rays of light that the sovereign and sun draped over them. The rocks filled with magic, pulling it up from the fairy earth and drawing it out for the sun. It would be a good crop this year, but it was his child and not his harvest that sat at the forefront of his mind. Gotta love how we keep coming up with new ideas of just what rock farming meant and just what rock farming is when. We all know Emily Larson does have a joke. We all know that it was just meant to be a silly little thing in that episode. But we keep finding new ways to determine why rock farming means. And I love it. Geoculture was not her world, and he knew it. As he too began scouring the landscape, he looked at all of his beautiful daughters. Clyde saw how they communed with the land, as good earth ponies should but he knew that their hearts were not in it. This was not their world, and Sunday they would leave, would need to leave. Piggy would have to leave first. This life could not keep her long, and no matter how many parties they could sit to throw, they could not help her attain the life her market planned for her. Clyde sighed, get to one of the mirror rocks that littered the ground around the long acres of his farm. Or how many stopped, Clyde lifted himself, Hand his head against the panorama of his fields, his eyes settled on Pinky once more, and at first he was confused. Suddenly, his star lighted up, saw the wonderful airs he stirred within her. He could not help but smile as her face went wide with a vast smile, as she began to hop around in happiness. Papa! Papa! She called out, Go see what I found! I found the newest little thing, and it's a thing! He smiled as he began to try across the sod earth, that was wet with the chilly dew of autumn. As he did, he realized that a frost could not be far away. He, as much as any other farmer, agricultural or geocultural, would soon have to harvest the fruits of their labor, or risk it having it locked deep within the frozen earth. Inky and Blinky trotted up to him. At first, the pair followed him. Maud was still working, peering around with him while it caused his curiosity. But soon, they were pelting forward as Pinky began to laugh, as smiles lifted across her face. Upon raising his stars, he saw something upon Pinky's foreleg. Inside an instant, he relaxed and smiled, realized that it was nothing more than one of the harbingers of the autumn now unfolding. Tis a woolly bear caterpillar there, and a fat and fair little fellow of that. See the bands on his black? He said, pointing out the two deep shades at either ends of the tiny creature. Even the least of the creatures in Equestria can know how the Pegasi shall set the winter. Thus is the magic in all things that live beneath the sun of Celestia. Even us, our bodies, called the girls at time. Piggy giggles as the creature crossed up her foreleg to her shoulder, its bristles tickled her. Ah, those two. He said, while seeing his sisters pass it gently between them, each of his darling daughters giving small giggles as it crawled past their shoulders, withers, over their necks, and down their backs. <coughs> Come now, let us find a sudden space of comfort and get back to our work. He said as he filled and set his sights at the tree line beyond the farm. As he went, the girls still passed the caterpillar between them, watching it with interest. Suddenly, a horrible realization sat through Clyde. Realization that his daughters had never taken the time to do something as simple as lift a caterpillar, commune, and sense the nature of this world. 
His eyes went once more to Pinky as he reached the trees. As he pranced up and down, she selected a fine, tall ash tree. On that, Inky lifted the caterpillar to the leaves. As the leaves had already been tinged with autumn shades, the caterpillar was soon lost among them. With sad sounds, the ponies turned back to the fields. As he saw Pinky bounce along, he heard her try to compose a song. As she did, she stumbled through the verses. This conversation, she used the word orange to attempt to describe the leaves of the coming autumn, that Hermione sat down and his filly tripped through the fields of rock. She was growing into her mark ever so quickly, he realized. Her perceptions were expanding in so many ways. Yet he did not know how to help her. Even in an event as simple as finding the caterpillar had swirled around her, caught in her love of surprise and new things, and brought them all new experience in a simple moment of joy. He still did not know what to do for her. He closed his eyes and made a small invoke. Do not worry. As in a divine voice on the breeze that flowed throughout the words, it moves. It comes in time. He thought he could not hear it. The laughter of the stars already filled his ears. As Clyde watched them run and call out to one another, his features were serene, and he breathed easier in the cool autumn air. The main showcase of Sugar Root Corner had gone quiet. Customers in their holiday tidings having departed as the mid-morning rust dissipated. Cupcake looked out the windows and saw that the Pegasi were drifting down a few flakes, just as scheduled. They were decorating the city, giving Ponyville that last little dusting that would make heartwarming Eve that much more picturesque. A family went by the window, the fools filled with excitement. Cupcake went to the window. Certain unanswered in folks went to her as she watched the foals walking beneath their parents' legs. She listened as they made cries of anticipation that seeped into the bakery. She placed her hoof to her body. A certain sadness lingered there. Frost was growing in the corners of the window, and as she watched, it seemed as though the crystals themselves were expanding before her eyes. Cupcake heard Kara's voice, heard him humming a holiday tune. It was the same one that she had begun as they worked together, and soon her thoughts turned to rejoining him. She tried back into the kitchen. As she looked up, she saw him working on a few other small details as the gingerbread house came closer and closer to being ready. She watched as Carrie tentatively added some small pieces. She smiled as he deliberated upon where to place the last few structural elements, the stutters, the chimney, and the trim. As he rested his head in his hoof, he sighed. Carrot looked up to her as the big white one of the frosting still sat upon his nose, and he gave a smile of resignation. He was calling on her again. Calling on her to make a decision. To say he hoped she wouldn't make long ago. With soft hoofs, she began to cross the table. But as he did, she felt herself press against something. She looked down and saw a bag. Opening it, she gave a small gasp as a silver package, expertly tied with fine ribbons and a large bow revealed itself. She looked up to him, held it in her hoof. He too stared her gasp, realizing what they had just done and the mistake they had made. So, I found a company that was willing to make you an offer, and loan offer, while I could set a fair terms, the elder said. Kara did his best to listen, tried to comprehend the talk of money and interest rates. However, terms did not escape him. Tower terms did escape him. All Kara knew was that he was sick. Sick of cupcake and himself being apart. Ivory had just left as summer was winding down. Already her presence was keenly missed. Already the toll on Cupcake was obvious. He opened his bakery just in time to make a bid to make the snacks for a school district. The special treats that filled the young minds through their morning of learning. Including a certain orange little filly along with her new friend, a certain white unicorn. To no one's surprise more than his own, he had won. The money was no fortune. But it was certainly something. It was proof that he could bake for a living. Cookie was spending her time getting ready as well. That he knew. She seemed a little lost without Ivory near. And it was times when she came around to the shop, he tried to fill his profiles to Ivory. To be everything he could for his mare. To try to give her his comfort. More often than not, he found to his happy relief. She was very willing to accept his affections. But as the time went on, he realized as he had moved towards helping him at the shop. 
What should have been an amazing and happy revelation for him filled him with worry. He did not want her to be his employee. He wanted her to be his lover, his friend. As he began making plans, found drawings that she had left behind when she trotted off at night to wherever she was living now. His idea was clear. To change the building, to make it an advertisement. He gazed over a picture of his bakery wrapped in a colorful trim, looking more like a gingerbread house than a structure. He had to admit, it was clever. Not exactly the most manly thing he would have thought to put his bakery, but clever. Carrot, now's not the time to start thinking manliness. This is a fic about ponies, and we are dealing with a romance story. I think that moment has passed. At that moment, though, autumn was setting in, as soon the dry season would start carrying the carrying business. He did everything he could to take her mind off the fact that soon she would be furloughed from Canal's catering business, and she would be unemployed like he had been. Together, they went through long walks through Whitetail Woods, or went up a nearby farm to go apple picking, selecting the biggest fruit to take home to the shop. Some days, they would just sit and watch the colorful trees bob on small breezes. Granny, why is that couple over there just too big? Busy looking at the trees instead of grabbing apples? I'll tell you you're older, honey. As they walked through the harvest fair, he had brought her knickknacks for the stalls. Done his best to win her prizes. Done all that he thought a proper cold fan was supposed to be doing since the setting. Her laughter when he had fallen over backwards as he tried to lift the hammer to ring the bell. Or when the ball had bounced back and struck him in the nose of the dunk tank. The wonderful sound reassured him that she knew what he was doing appreciated how happy he was trying to make her. As they sat together, she wrapped warmly to his four legs, staring out into the fair as the lights flickered on. He had a felt a powerful realization. It was then that he realized something about the game of this, the intangible secret that she was still filling her and making her worry. She had given a happy sigh and yawned, wiped her head against his chest as the music of the midway had floated over them. It was then he realized that this was like a carnival game. He may be playing it, but it was playing him right back. It was in competition with him. As long as this existed, that these fleeting moments, these all too short hours together, this was all they have. He did not like being able to walk to her to wherever she was living. He hated not being able to draw the fear and worry out of her. He hated this almost inescapable urge to sneak along after her. Follow her after their goodnight kiss, risk shattering the trust she had placed in him. He was starting to hate this again. Hate it utterly. He wanted to see what her body was like when she was free from worry. He wanted to look into those rosy eyes when they were not filled with long, drawn out pain. To see her liberated from her worry, only happy. He also wanted to see. You finished that sentence with a perfect joke, and Trixie is going to electrocute you in the flank! Sorry, Trix. Carrot began to blush slightly, even as he and the realtor went up the streets of Honeyville. Even as the gray and bespectacled realtor went out about interest rates and mortgages. Carrot felt herself being drawn into his happy thoughts. The thoughts of her warm, safe, and happy to be near him. The amber-colored colt let an image slip into his mind, let one that had been nursing again just the slightest bit of attraction in his conscious thoughts. It filled him as they went down the cobblestone streets, the weight of his saddlebag shifting around him. In his mind's eye, he saw her in the bed, his bed, the fairy bed at the top of the stairs in the room above his shop. He saw her there, laying a soft look across her face, a happy look as he slept peacefully. He felt her along the length of his body. Then as the night air washed over them through the open window, AHEM! Came the soft voice of the realtor, snapping carried it out of the contemplation that was sending a rather serene look across his faces. Leah, yeah, continued the great stallion as he reached for the door of the loan office. Carol looked up and tried to figure out where exactly the realtor had brought him. The building was short and half timbered. It was simple yet morose place. He gazed upon the sign painted window, trying to read in the midday sun. Hospital Loan and Trust. It ran in a rather nondescript front. Below, it read the name of the proprietor, owner, and loan officer. 
All the titles rolled into one, all their ellipses leading into a single name that stood out boldly. It was short, strong name, one that got carried against his thoughts. At once, the name that lay there caught the inside of his memory, ignited something within him that he desperately knew he should remember. He looked at the name once more, tried to think of where he had heard it. Once, he felt the hose of the realtor upon him, shoving into the ground, interrupting the chain of memories that was linking him back to the name. As he hit the ground, there was a rumble, and a wild horse whinny. He looked to see something that awakened all his remembrances. The massive stallion stood in the doorway. On the ground there was another stallion, this one holding his head. To Herod's horror, blood began to drip from the stallion's ear. At once, all the happy thoughts of his lady in love, lying in the moonlight, emptied out of him, drifted away as shortly as the red droplets were falling from the terrified stallion before him, plopping from the cobblestones. Oh, I'll sue you for that! That's it, so You try. You try, and we'll see what the law has to say about the thousand bits you just stole from me. Answered a stallion in the doorway, his eyes wide and fierce. But, 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 continued the smaller stallion, struggling to rise from the ground. I, I didn't. You didn't what? You didn't think that I found out? Now you think you're too smart for me, you fucking piece of trash? Ha! I've been run blind by smarter books than you. Answered the seared stallion. While the tossed through all manners of papers out over the bleeding, whippering stallion that stood in the street. I'm taking all the collateral into the passes too. Answered the huge, rippling stallion as a tuss of foam gathered in the corner of his mouth. You're liquidated. Try taking it to court. We'll see how that works for ya. The stallion barely moved. He has angry eyes still caught carrot in their glare. You my twelve fifteen? The massive stallion hissed. Yes, sir, Carrot whispered. Give me five minutes to clear up a bit. This is the stallion beginning to shake and tremble as though he were literally trying to draw the anger out of himself. Yes, sir. As a carrot, inside the instant the stallion had turned back inside the loan office. Carrot's head went back to the sign. The name stood out so it made of luminescent magic, highlighted and bolted as it flew through his memory. His thoughts flew back over a few months to the start of the summer that had now passed. Back to the day he'd seen this pony similarly raised, standing in front of the mill. Quarry. The loan officer was Quarry. As he sat in the reception room, Karen watched the secretary readjust a few things, then go back to work as slow as he barely noticed him. Karen rummaged through the saddle bags and made sure that all the papers were there, a little container too. Despite the realtor's reassurances that he would be fine, Karen could not help but notice he had not bothered to stick around. A new wave of cursing through the room went beyond the door, and at once, Karen and the secretary looked up towards it. Karen turned back to look down at the saddle bag. He looked up just in time to see the secretary staring him over at her glasses. Don't slay it, Sweeney, she said with surprisingly certainty. What should I do? Asked Carol with a of desperation. If he gets mad. Try to get late, she answered. At once, he heard a sigh and call him. And even as he stood, he felt his body already covering to follow the other device. Come on and have a seat, spoke the stallion. The gray eyes already affixed a carrot as he entered the room. Carrot was surprised by how sterile and early unadored the office was. No plants, no inspirational posters, no family puddles, just the desk, the cabinets, two chairs, and the stallion who regarded him faithfully. Good afternoon, said Carrot. I'm here because you're highly recommended. Where in the world do I know you from? Interrupted Quarry, a huge stallion leaning across his own forelegs, regarding Carrot with a suspicious glare. I worked at I worked at Ledger's Mill, said Carrot, forcing himself not to tremble. Oh, replied the stallion as he leaned back. So to recognize the name, Carrot Cake, you quit the mill cake. 
Yes, well, no, sir, no, Mr. Lasher knew that I would be going when I found something that, that matched my mark. He, he does, sir, Carrot. Yeah, Lasher does that. Done that for a lot of coats and fillers. That's one of the things I like about Lasher. Spoke Quarry without letting his eyes for Carrot. He's a good stallion. They're good ponies. Carrot was surprised at how much more relaxed and calmer Corey was when he mentioned Ledger's name. His tone and volume dropped as though in reverence. If Ledger sees something in your cake, spoke the fast stallion. His voice a little rumble and I still turned mental. I'll hear what you have to say. It never became easy in that room. The feeling of menace that flowed out the stallion never anticipated. Yet as Carrot went through his practice lines, he thought about why he was here. About getting that loan would allow him to finish buying the equipment he needed. Allow him to open up his shot to Wapkin patrons, rather than those ponies he was contracted to. Something of Carrot's simple joy filled his words. Even when he came to the hard part, the part about the numbers, he just let the image of Cupcake fill his head. The thought of her with him in the kitchen, the idea that he wouldn't need to work a job to help him, and it does be there with him. This image filled his hand even as he looked to the large stallion who gazed at all impeccably. With her in his mind, the rest became that much easier, if not easy. When he spoke of her, he did not use her name, instead he used a different word that came to mind. A word that he realized spoke more about them than just how they were working to grow his business. Partner, he called her. His partner. He was, he was not an employee after all. He wanted her to see him as her lover, friend, and her partner. That last bit he kept in his own head, as Corey did not seem to be the type to be swayed by romantic notions. Corey looked at his head as Carrot told him about how he had won a contract with the school district. How his clever partner had gone from market stall to market stall, finding sellers who could sell breads with their products. And one day he had won five contracts in such a manner. Corey seemed depressed. Sort of. Maybe. And, and th that's all I have to say, really, said Carrot, dropping his head. Once he remembered something he wanted to do. With that, Carrot opened the tin and placed it on Corey's desk. There in the mess stood a piece of carrot cake. A slice very much like the ones that made up his mark. Cory stared at it for a second. With a wicked smile, he took it in hoof and looked at Carrot. Cute, he said as he looked at his mouth. The stallion chewed slowly, gave a little nod. With that, he slid a piece of paper and found Carrot. As Carrot looked it over, he could barely read. Cory was walking around the bare room, chewing on a carrot cake loudly. Watching Carrot as he read, a sudden shock went up Carrot's back. He realized in terror that the stallion had one of his hooves on his shoulder. Trembles of disgust went up Carrot's spine. The deep, wet smell of the stallion's breath drifted over him, tinged by the slight smell of carrot cake. You know what the stupidest statement in all the equestrian history was, Cake? Asked the stallion, his voice more than a rumble, his breath once more thick across Carrot's face. No, sir, spoke Carrot, giving a shudder. It was this. It's easier to ask for forgiveness than permission, said Quarry, looking over Carrot's shoulder as he read the paper. The son of a bitch who said that smirked as he said it, then asked for my forgiveness. Carrot swallowed hard. No. I'm told he still walks with a lip cake. Carrot closed his eyes, tried to fight for breath. Those are fine terms there, Cake. Good ones. Lesher likes ya. See something in ya. That means something to me. I think you've got some plans, and I'll back ya. But Cake, you try to lie to me. Try to steal from me. Or I'll think you used me. Carrot Corey got down and saw the paper shaking. He knew he did not need to go on. You got a name for this place? Cake! Asked the stallion, removing himself from near hovering over Carrot. Carrot felt himself breathe again, and as he exhaled, he spilled the name across the desk. Carrot Cake's Bakery Company, LLC! He stated in a voice that betrayed how very much he understood Quarry's meaning. 
That's a terrible house and name, Cake. With right, Corey, sneering as he stared out the roof's small window. I'm... I think you're chasing it, said Carrie as he stared at the quarry. He tossed a quill upon the desk and pointed to a small ball of ink. See that you do. Sign the book and paper already. As Carrot left the office, the secretary was surprised to see him smiling. She was even more smiling when Carrot laid one of the other pieces of carrot cake on a napkin across her desk. As she thanked him, he laughed, his head held high and a great fat check in his cell bags. Seems like a nice young cult, said the secretary as he once again nibbled on the little offering. Meh, answered Quarry as he looked down across the reception room with no expression evident on his face. Man, Quarry sounds like an intimidating OC. I wonder how some of the more villainous and intimidating OCs I've, we've read in the past few years felt. Like, for instance, Checker. Hey, Checker, how do you feel about Quar- Checker? And I repeatedly... Regret everything I've ever done. Well, there you have it, folks. When you're so scary, you make the second most evil MLP OC out there shaking her boots. We got problems. Red Eye? Meh. Outside, Carrie dropped it happily towards the bank. And I felt that everything would fall into place. Now, Cupcake could leave the hiring job and would not have to find another one. Now they could spend that time together in the bakery. Now they were much closer, he believed, to winning the game of this. As the light of the autumn day fell through the golden leaves around him, Carol was unaware of something very important. He could not know that the game of this had been upset by this act. He could not know he just committed a bitter offense. A yellow card was now being held high over everything he had wished and hoped for. Going back to... The new place I found when we moved here in 2016. I gotta admit, I fell in love with this, much like how Karen fell in love with this bakery. It was a kind of amazing. Two rooms were available for beds, and one was a studio. Granted, we've combined that studio with the weight room for my mom lately, but since then, I've been very proud to have it. It's been very nice to have, and it's even more wonderful that I could actually build up a good cast of characters with it. While Trixie has always been a mainstay, I find that my desk and the other desks that I use for these live reads have built up over time. Hmm. Maybe next time I should talk more about how I started using Trixie as a main cast member for this little live read.